It is time for more Annie News Cut content. ReZero Season 2, Episode 12. How Subaru's post death realities went in the novel. Let's check it out. What Subaru was experiencing this episode wasn't just hell. If it was, then he would have been able to handle it no problem. I mean, he was always fine being the only one who had to suffer. What's worse than hell? I don't know, I don't know. other people suffering with you in hell? But to see so many different flashbacks of so many different people going through such excruciating pain, well, that was something that went far beyond any hell that Subaru could have ever imagined. Each showed Subaru one of his unforgivable crimes. And in almost all of them, there was more to it than what we were shown in the anime. Whether it be more reactions from additional characters, or even a more detailed showcase of Reinhardt's power, that was sick. there is a little bit more that needs to be said. So, let's take a look at what we missed out from those as well as the additional stuff left out from the Witch's Tea Party. Alright. Episode 37, Witch's Tea Party, covering the last two chapters of Volume 12 of the Light Novel. As Subaru recalled the final moments of the previous loop, he couldn't even begin to imagine what was going through Amelia's mind as she went for the kiss. Mind nor break. Nor did he even want to. But despite how messed up the situation was, Subaru didn't regret that that was the last thing he felt. Her lips served as a grave reminder as to what happens when he isn't around to support her. Sure, that last loop may have had the best start by far, but if- Does that mean we have to with her, be with her all the time? I thought it's because we got rid of the letter. Like, we didn't get rid of it. Roswell got rid of it. And then it's her trying to be- Trying to like, be a big girl and trying to do everything by herself and then spamming the trials. And then she broke her mind, right? But it sounds like- if we leave her for too long, she is gonna just go crazy, so I think that we gotta solve this shit here first and then go to the mansion. If it meant leading to Amelia's mental breakdown, then Subaru wanted no part of it. So, before waking up Amelia, Subaru first resolved himself yet again to be the only one to suffer to achieve his goal. To him, it didn't matter how many hells he had to go through. So long as there existed a future worth grasping, then everything would be worth it. A very ironic statement considering the events yet to come. Now, as Subaru tried to make sense out of Roswell's actions, he came to notice that his motivations weren't that far off from that of the witch's cult. I mean, both tried to obey the words of the tome as best they could. True. And it seems like Roswell's trying to free the seal on Echidna, right? Just like Betrigus is trying to free the seal on Satala, even though... That seal might be just weakened, or maybe it doesn't even exist, and it's a conspiracy. But the methodology in which they did so differed completely. For the witch's cult, Betelgeuse only had incomplete prophecies to work That's right, because this is a gospel, but Roswell has a grimoire. Gospel is like a defect version. It may tell you the truth, but it's very not detailed and obscure compared to the grimoire, right? So, much of his plans were conducted on the spot with only vague descriptions to serve as the foundation. Roswell, on the other hand, Basically, Betrigus has his own headcanon of what the book is telling him. Roswell has actually the source material. It's dictated by the tome. His schemes within Sanctuary and even his death to the rabbits were all because that's what the book told him to do. Subaru also believed that forcing him to return by death was something that the tome had dictated as well. Probably. So, if Roswell's book was telling him to end the world or force Subaru into a situation where he had no choice but to die, then that made Roswell a far greater threat than Betelgeuse ever was. A threat? Nah, I think that Roswell is still our ally, even though he's doing really messed up things to make us suffer. I, at the end of the day, our, like, Roswell's best interest is us succeeding. It's just we're having skill issues, and the current self is not able to overcome the challenges in front of us. But if we do do that, let's remember all the things that's led up to these moments. All of those are due to Roswell. In hindsight, it may seem all good, and right now it may seem bad, but just, just remember that, like, his goals, at the end of the day, ultimately, right now, I think if we succeed, he succeeds. It also meant that he, too, was at the mercy of the tome. Subaru- I don't like how he keeps saying tome. He does not have the tome of wisdom. It's two fucking perfect copies known as the Grimoire. Who knew that there was nothing he could do to stop Roswell if his goals ended up straying from the path that the book desired. He knew it would almost certainly always lead to a restart. But despite knowing how futile his efforts would be, Subaru still resolved himself to find an answer that defied even this magic tome. So that's why he sought out the help of Echidna. If anyone was going to be able to help him find an answer, then it would definitely be her. Probably. But remember, 
Getting invited back to her domain for a third time required a desire for knowledge far greater than ever before. He needed to yearn for an answer more than how he did when he lost his mind. The problem with that though was replicating a situation in which that was possible. To imitate a madness that stemmed from having his flesh being eaten away wasn't something very easily doable. In the anime it just seemed like he just went in and screamed but... I don't know. I feel like this time he wasn't as desperate as the time before but it worked. But this isn't really an invitation, this time we went through a trial. It was much easier just to drop him right into the second trial. Yeah. But as we'll find out later, this wasn't something that Echidna had planned for. Bringing us now to Subaru's- This is or this isn't? Really ...doable. It was much easier just to drop him right into the second trial. But as we'll find out later, this wasn't something that Echidna wasn't. had planned for. Bringing us now to Subaru's unknowable present. To give more context as to what exactly this was, Subaru's consciousness had essentially been removed from his body. He was put into a state of confusion similar to when his mind shifts from present back to past. But this time the only thing that remained of himself was his consciousness alone. At first, the experience of being this non-material existence brought with it a feeling of fear. I mean, suddenly having no arms, legs, or body really took the concept of phantom limbs to a whole new level. I guess when we're watching the episode, we don't really see, like, Subaru, except him being dead and other people. So he's just kind of observing and that is the consciousness that we're speaking about. Because it's from that consciousness POV that we're watching through the eyes of, but there's no eyes. It was only after Subaru remembered the concept of a deep breath that he was able to calm himself. Once he did, he found that all that remained of his material self was his sense of vision, followed shortly after by his sense of sound. Both of which brought forth the very first disturbing flashback. If you remember from my very first cut content, this death didn't actually take place outside in the courtyard. Instead, Subaru had taken the knife from Rem's bedside and killed himself right there. Even more things to suggest forbidden Appa theory, bro. Like, bro, in the source material, he took the Appa knife and ended himself. Remember, every time you do that shit, what happens? The more you lean into the Appa stuff, more bad things happen. The moments that he decided not to do it, Amelia showed up and like was an emotional support, right? So Appa theory going hard in the source material. Instead, Subaru had taken the knife from Rem's bedside and killed himself right there. So this whole scene should have been inside the room that Rem was being kept in. Because it wasn't, it resulted in a few alterations that needed to be made. Mainly with regards to a little bit of extra stuff omitted from the end. But before we get to that, let's first start from the beginning. As Subaru's consciousness started to make out the sounds and vision of Amelia crying over his betrayal, he found himself to be confronted by what he feared the most, the aftermath of his failure. Now, if I'm being honest, this whole scene actually felt a little bit rushed to me, much really? to the point that it made it lose a lot of the impact that I initially thought it was going to have. Hmm. Felix shitting on us at the end was kind of out of nowhere and I was like whoa but I thought that Wilhelm's like cry for not help but confusion of like why would you do this after you've given me like a reason to live or something like how could you have just done this it was sad one of the reasons for this was that Wilhelm was much more emotional than what we saw in the anime even more the other was that this was supposed to be one of many firsts for Subaru oh shit it was the first time that he'd ever seen himself in such a state it was also the first time that he'd ever seen Amelia grieve for him but most importantly, it was the first time that he'd ever given thought to what happened after his death. This wasn't something he was ever supposed to think about. The worlds he left behind were never supposed to mean anything. All they ever should have been were midway points to the future that he desired. And the reason for that was actually very simple. To think about it any other way it's, would it's too hard. Subaru's entire world. Exactly. The guilt that's going to build up. Knowing that all those failed time loops, right? More people are suffering because of him. Like, you want to, like, hide the painful memories. Anything that's too traumatic, you try to, like, subconsciously forget. It would invalidate his entire way of thinking. That's why he wanted nothing more than for the vision in front of him to stop. But since he was only a consciousness, he could neither turn his head away nor close his eyes. He was stuck seeing the results of his own failure all the way to the end. When Wilhelm rushed into the room after hearing Amelia's cries, his immediate loss of composure made Subaru even more distraught than he already was. 
That was a pretty good moment, but apparently Wilhelm was even more emotional in the source material. It was the fact that someone like the Sword Devil had an expression of sheer dread on his face that shook Subaru to his very core. Wilhelm even had to take a few moments before finally realizing exactly what it was he was looking at, at which point he covered the wound and began to press Subaru's chest in an attempt to keep his heart beating. And like remember, like all this shit, the whale subjugation, the thank yous, the heartfelt relationships we made, this is just a couple days ago man. Like imagine going through all this shit, everything is so happy happy, I will forever, like I will serve you my lord kind of deal. And then, a couple days later, you just find this guy just dead. And you're like, what the hell just happened? And nobody remembers who even Rem is right now. It must be so confusing. Covered the wound and began to press Subaru's chest in an attempt to keep his heart beating. When Felix had stopped the healing magic, Wilhelm immediately began to question why. He still believed that there was more that Felix could be doing. Well, the soul has already gone, right? The physical body was healed, but the soul is gone. But really, he just hadn't yet realized that Subaru was already gone. Or rather, he didn't want to. Mm. So Felix had to make it clear that Subaru's soul was no longer there. It was a statement that made Wilhelm have an outburst of rage. He clenched his fist out of regret, then proceeded to slam it straight into the floor. Would love to see that. not only the wooden floorboards, but also his fist as well. That's right, because in the source material, it happened in this room because Subaru ended himself with the paring knife from the appa. Now with a bloodied fist, Wilhelm could only look up towards the ceiling as he lamented over the loss of a dear friend. Felix, on the other hand, bore more a feeling of disgust as he could only interpret Subaru's actions as selfish. Yeah, Felix is mad. The dialogue Felix was saying at the end was pretty fucked up, but I guess it does make sense. That was Subaru's crime. Although it was hard to make sense of the situation, the one thing that was made perfectly clear was that he had made a significant impact on all their lives. It was something he always failed to consider whenever he chose to leave them behind. Upon returning back to the tomb, we saw that Subaru began to speculate that this was part of the second trial. If that was in fact what this was, then Subaru was beyond terrified of having to face it. Yeah, sure, he had committed himself to facing Hal numerous times over, but Subaru- It's like, the guilt that he feels for everyone else. When it's just us and we know that we die and we loop, it's fine, we can just move forward. I can deal with it myself, but if everyone else is also suffering beyond that and I have to witness that, I guess it's overbearing guilt. Facing this unknowable present was something far more terrifying than hell itself. He was no longer confident that he'd be able to put himself through all the scenes of what comes after his death. I mean, how could he? This was, after all, the very thing that he feared the most. In the next scene of what lay beyond hell, as Subaru's consciousness bore witness to his second crime, the heroic Wilhelm run made an appearance shortly after Amelia. What? Wilhelm showed up here too? What? His body was covered with wounds after having fought many of the witch cultists, but that didn't stop him from inching his way closer to Subaru. Right, there was like a bomb that exploded. As he, did, he began to apologize to Subaru for not being able to save him. It wouldn't be wrong to assume that Wilhelm felt personally responsible for the loss of life in front of him. In fact, Wilhelm actually seemed to be even more impacted by this than how he was in the previous flashback. I thought he was going to say he was more impacted by Subaru's death than his wife's death. He seemed to be even more impacted by this than how he was in the previous flashback. Both him and several of his companions began to shed tears. They were helpless to do anything but silently bear witness to the fate of the person who had brought them salvation. Every single one of them was a person that Subaru had fought beside, and each had made a promise to return to the capital together in victory. But now all they could do was weep over the fact that that was no longer possible. Subaru was in awe over the extent to which all these soldiers were affected by his death. But what brought the most anguish was the fact that this was a world where his devotion was never explained. Amelia would never be- That's right, the devotion was never explained. This is the most tragic heroic run. Because we were so close to the finish line, we did everything correctly. And just when we thought we're done, we have to run away and end ourselves in order to save everybody. But even in this timeline, look how sad it is be able to find out why Subaru had done so much to help her. It was a world in which his own weakness led to all sorts of things being left unfinished. That was his crime. When Subaru returned back to the tomb, his attempts to evade reality led him to roll around in a panic. He didn't want to have to face the crimes that birthed from his own weakness anymore. 
Now, at this point, the soul is close to breaking. I still feel like Emilia Yandere mode is when her soul was broken because of the trials. If Carmilla didn't show up as Rem and didn't heal Subaru's soul, I wonder what kind of Subaru would exist with this, like, broken mind. Would he turn into, like, a Roswell type? So, he crashed himself into the sides of the tomb all while his head scraped the ground and began to bleed. It wasn't the pain of the impact that made tears start to flow down his face, though. It was instead the idea that there were worlds that continued after his death. Yep. The very idea of this even being a possibility was enough to shatter the foundation with which Subaru had used to fight. Up until now, he'd always thought that it was him being left behind by everyone else. But now he was starting to think that maybe it Everyone else moves on beyond that. ...was actually everyone else being left behind by him. Subaru wasn't so sure anymore. After the flashback with- We have no confirmations of how that shit happens, though. Because those memories that were shown after Subaru's death, I think were just like artificially created by a kid now, or at least she seemed to comment something about that. There's no confirmations on like how this power really works in terms of how those timelines continue. Like, does a timeline just get erased? I don't fucking know. With Ram and Beatrice, we then get to a lengthier one with Reinhardt. One that I'm sure that many of you weren't expecting. But in it was quite a bit of important information. This is sick. Stuff that gives more context to Puck's potential involvement with everything. So, starting from the beginning, the massive forest that once surrounded the Roswell Mansion was now nothing more than soil. Puck had completely leveled the entire area. Not just with his massive body, but also with winds that were now strong enough to knock over entire trees. When Reinhardt made his appearance, there were a couple of interesting things to note from the lines that ended up being emitted from the anime. Okay. Before talking about Amelia, Puck first spoke of how he knew that this would be the outcome. He went to imply that this was something he already knew was going to happen. We'll go back, go back. ...to be the outcome. Before talking about Amelia, Puck first spoke of how he knew that this would be the outcome. Okay. He went to imply that this was something he already knew was going to happen. As in, like, Reinhardt would show up and defeat Puck from ending the world? Which already is pretty intriguing all on its own. But then Puck goes on to say something even more revealing. Something that I think the anime decided to leave out on purpose and save for later. Okay. So if you don't want to know what it is, then feel free to skip ahead to the following timestamp. And I'm gonna assume that this is never addressed in the anime? Therefore I should watch this? If we watch this and I guess spoiled to something huge, I will ban everyone in chat. If this is... Well, how would we know, right? How would we know if it's okay to watch or not? Just never mention it again. Let's just raw dog it. Anyway, what Puck says is that he also knew that Reinhardt would mm. come and try to stop him. Okay. Followed by the statement that Amelia could not be saved unless he froze the world. But if I do not do this, that girl cannot be saved. Saved from what? Exactly. Amelia's already dead. Is Puck implying that he's going to be the bigger villain instead of Amelia? Because, I, I don't know. What is the assumption here? How do you save a girl that's already dead unless it's her reputation that's going to be tarnished because people blame her for all the shitty things happening? So Puck being the ender of worlds and Reinhardt defeating Puck suddenly places Puck as the bad person and takes the heat off of Amelia, similar to how Julius took the heat off of Subaru and was the bad guy when Subaru was acting up? I don't know. Which, if I had to guess, was pretty much Puck's way of saying that he needed to force Subaru to return by death. I mean... If we assume that Puck does no return by death... Well, if I do not do this, that girl cannot be saved. Is, is that a statement after killing Subaru? Or Because this is a statement with Reinhardt, right? Do this is a very obscure action right now. But from the beginning of ReZero, Puck, <laughs> remember, even break time as well, in the garden after Arc 1. Bro, we mentioned Puck's name without even knowing Puck. We knew everything about Puck's 9 to 5 without even meeting Puck, because in the previous run we knew, but in the successful run, they never met until the loot seller. Puck does not make a comment out of this and just goes along with it. And then in the break time, Emily even mentions, oh, Puck, how does Subaru know you? And Puck just like plays it off. So at that point from the beginning, I always thought, Puck must know Subaru's regression ability. He must know. He also can read our minds or feelings somehow when we get in direct contact, right? Maybe not specific details, but I, I think that Puck does know from the beginning. 
It's the only thing that makes sense out of his statement regarding this being the only way to save Amelia. In any case, Puck's actions was something that Reinhardt simply couldn't forgive. They didn't fall in line with his standards of justice, and justice was the single thing that Reinhardt stood for. Mm. So he was left with no choice but to pull out his dragon sword, a legendary weapon left behind by the divine dragon from over 400 years ago. Volcanica! It was a sword that existed only to right that which was wrong. Now, because Reinhardt already knew how the battle would end, he made a promise that if Puck didn't move then he wouldn't make him suffer. He was <laughs> so absolutely nice. confident that he wouldn't lose this battle. So, out of pure courtesy, Reinhardt offered Puck a painless death. But that was a deal that Puck couldn't accept. It was for the sake of his vow that Puck felt he had to use every bit of life he had left to fulfill his goal. If he was to just roll over and die, then that would be the same thing as turning his back on his contract. So, how the fuck are you gonna say vow 10 seconds ago and then refer to it as contract 10 seconds later? I hate how we just keep jumping from different jargon. And in the world of ReZero, these terminologies are so specific and they all mean a different thing. I fucking hate this shit. Tomb of Wisdom, Grimoire, fucking, and fucking Gospel, it gets thrown around all the fucking time. Vow, Pact, Contract, all three of this shit just makes the same, it's the same shit. So, Puck's only option was to fight till the bitter end. An end that was immediately met by a single slash of the Dragon Blade. As mana circled all around Reinhardt's attack, not only did the slash work to slay the great spirit in front of him, but it also reverted the area around him back to its original state. Reverted. The snow that once blocked out the air was now gone. The ground that had only recently been flattened had now begun to sprout up flowers. Wait, what? Yo, this goes beyond just power. What the hell? Yo, Reinhardt's sword is giving back life? What the hell kind of property is this? The way Subaru saw it. Reinhardt's single attack had both ended the world and simultaneously brought about its recreation. Okay, this this dragon sword is no longer just almighty. It's like giving life. Like, what? Like, I get the clearing the snow shit, but like, all the destroyed areas, it's like, vibrant again with green life. Like, what? It was as if no battle had even taken place. Not a single trace of Pucker, his destruction was left to be found. What the hell? The last thing that Subaru... That, that must... I don't know, it, it is the Dragon Sword, right? It, it is the Ryuken, Volcanica, right? Like, it's a very important sword. It's probably one of the most powerful swords, if not the best, like, powerful sword in the world, so... Alright, good to know. It, it can bring back fucking grass and shit, too, on top of just destroying. Subaru heard as this scene came to an end was that Lady Felt would surely be sad. It was a final whisper before mm -hmm. for his destruction was left to be found. The last thing that Subaru heard as this scene came to an end was that Lady Felt would surely be sad. About Subaru? It was a final whisper before Subaru went on to behold eight more unknowable presents. I guess that implies that Felt obviously has some level of affection for Subaru since Arc 1. By the end, he could no longer tell if he was back in reality or still in those nightmares. Although that's what he wanted to refer to them as, he wasn't even sure if that would be correct. To call them a nightmare would be to assume that they weren't real. It's not confirmed though, is it? I thought Echidna kind of made that shit up. But Subaru could no longer simply dismiss those visions as hallucinations. Instead, he wondered if they were perhaps genuine realities of what was hell beyond hell. He did consider the possibility of them being worlds created from his memories, but yeah. that wouldn't explain all the moments in which people were talking about stuff that he obviously didn't know before. It was for that reason that he couldn't fully deny their existence. As Subaru was having what was pretty much an existential crisis, all it took was a single sentence from the one he cherished most to bring him back to reality. Cherish the most. Not Amelia. Rem. Rem is the one he cherishes the most. Carmilla took on the form of Rem because in Subaru's subconscious, even though Rem is number two, he cherishes Rem the most. A single smile from her face was enough to stare Subaru away from the dead end that he was rapidly approaching. Alright. But even then, that still wasn't enough to release him from the guilt of his supposed crimes. That's why he began to lay everything out to the person standing in front of him. He wanted that person to pass judgment over both him and the crimes he'd been committing. Atone. He wanted to be scolded and receive a punishment equivalent to that of the weakness that had caused so many others so much pain. But that punishment never came. Instead, Subaru was met with a gentle forgiveness that he felt unbefitting to receive. 
A forgiveness that, as we saw, implored him to give up. Whoa, the art. Half Carmilla, half Rem. This was the one and only weakness that Rem would never allow, leading Subaru to expose Carmilla for who she was. That's right, Rem would never say just give up. Rem would say fight on, move forward. Now, Subaru's sudden outburst of rage made Carmilla think that he was going to start hitting her. So she began to plead with him so that he wouldn't. <laughs> of course. What, what, what? He was going to start hitting her. What, you're going to start hitting her? Now, Subaru's sudden outburst of rage made Carmilla think that he was going to start hitting her. <laughs> Subaru's outburst of rage are always so interesting. I don't know. Me, me. Because, like, again, just the actions of Subaru just, like, doesn't make sense to me until I try to really, really think about from his perspective and why it would be. But, like, all right. So she began to plead with him so that he wouldn't. Of course, Subaru was never actually going to do that. But there was no hiding the anger he felt towards this witch for the sly trick that she had just tried to pull. What pissed Subaru off even more, though, was the timid demeanor that Carmilla seemed to have. You'd rather her be more of a bitch than nice. Everything from the way she spoke to the way that she carried herself Very soft. seemed to irritate him more and more. The more angry Subaru got, the more excuses that Carmilla seemed to make. She was saying how it was Echidna's fault for making her do it, then talked about how everyone was always bullying her. But that certainly- Carmilla gets bullied all the time? I mean, if you look at her and her overall demeanor, it does seem like she gets pushed around. It wasn't what Subaru wanted to hear. His anger and frustration grew as he genuinely began to consider trying to make the switch shut up by force. Jesus! He just didn't want to listen to anything she had to say anymore. Damn! This was about the time that Echidna decided to make her appearance. But unlike how in the anime Subaru simply dismissed the fact that he'd been played with, the Subaru in the novels wasn't so willing to let it go. He refused to sit down and talk until an apology or explanation for Carmilla's actions were given. Oh. It was the least she could do after having essentially violated what was one of Subaru's own personal sanctuaries. Personal sanctuaries. By taking on the form of Rem, someone he cherishes the most, and speaking lies. Of course he'd be mad. But if she didn't do this, then Subaru could have been even worse off, right? His soul would have literally shattered from the mental stress from these trials. So Echidna sent Carmilla to kind of save Subaru, right? Unless there are some ulterior motives beyond just saving his soul. Despite knowing the importance of the conversation he wanted to have, Carmilla's actions simply weren't something that Subaru could forgive without an apology. So if Echidna was in fact the person who put her up to it, then she was the one who needed to meet his demands. It was an ultimatum that Echidna didn't seem to take all too kindly. But she knew that they would get nowhere without her saying at least something. So, rather than apologize, she instead began to pin all the blame on Carmilla, <laughs> stating that everything- Yo, that drip- what is this scarf? Her outfit? That scarf is so fucking long. I feel like she could fight with those scarves. I feel like it's a weapon or something. The bottom just straight up looks like fingers here. What the hell is this? Stating that everything Carmilla did was out of her own desire to do so. Going on about how Carmilla went ahead and used the trial as an excuse to play with Subaru's emotions. This was the answer that Subaru was hoping for. He didn't want to have to bear any resentment towards Echidna. But even though this was the answer that Echidna gave, it still wasn't the truth. She pretty much went on to undermine the entire thing right after saying it. Hmm? Asking Subaru if he was satisfied now that he'd heard the words that he wanted to hear. You see, she knew that he was already well aware of the truth. Subaru just didn't want to accept it. He didn't want to believe that Echidna would do something so cruel. And then, this episode is the one where Echidna's mask does come off, right? And we get to realize that she is a witch after all. Until this point, well even before too, I've, I've never really completely trusted her because she's a witch. And she came off as the most reasonable, the most, I guess, relatively kind compared to everyone else. She's not just like fucking us up, just killing us, just torturing us. But the greediness has always been there, trying to get content out of us. And now she professes the contract that she wants to make with us, right? And now we get to really see what she's all about. It's not like Akedina didn't regret having to resort to such methods, though. It just wasn't something she felt the need to apologize for. I mean, if she hadn't done what she did, then the trial that Subaru was accidentally thrown into would have worn him down to nothing. This was the conclusion that she came to after having watched Subaru go through countless iterations of trials she personally designed. It also brought forth- She personally designed. Again, don't really know exactly. 
is it complete true? Is it complete false? But she did design those memories. A significant contradiction. Remember, Echidna herself once said that she never gets involved with the results of a trial. If someone was going to fail, then failure was one of the results that she wanted to know. So, huh. Subaru was wondering why she changed her mind. Yeah, she's going out because she wants to woo Subaru into a lore of... I don't know. Basically, make him have more reasons to accept a contract, right? If he is more... If he realizes that Akin is there to help and, you know, potentially we could solve all the problems together, it would be one hell of a teamwork, though. With all her knowledge and with all her unlimited tries, imagine the possibilities, but at the same time, you know, she's a witch. It sounds too good to be true. Well, Akedena wasn't so heartless as to not regret the result of letting Subaru's mind break. It was because of this that she did what she thought was best to prevent that. Okay. This answers- I mean, I don't, I don't disagree that, like, she showed up. Like, this scene, though. I remember seeing this shit, and I, at that point, I was like, I think we're getting baited into a false sense of security. I don't disagree that she did this to also protect his soul from being breaking, but I think there's also an equal, if not even greater motive to help him out, to make him feel more comfortable, and then yoink him out of the contract. Prevent that. This answer slowly went to disperse all the anger and rage that Subaru had accumulated. There was no denying the fact that Echidna had just saved him. It's not like he was going to thank her for it, but he also wasn't going to hold a grudge against her either. Instead, the two just proceeded to have their tea party. Their initial conversation of the trial brought forth a bit more on Subaru's authority. Yes, the realities Subaru saw were nothing more than fictitious constructs, mm. but Akitana couldn't confirm the principles under which Return by Death functioned. She literally, I mean, I guess based on any of his words here, she, she just made up all, all the different timelines up then, right? Look at this. Subaru's authority. Yes, the realities Subaru saw were nothing more than fictitious constructs. Nothing more than fictitious constructs. Now, I don't know. Honestly, Usually, I'm just completely down to agree with any news because he seems like he knows they cut content a lot. But I would read zero. He kind of sus, bro. So can I truly believe this? That like all of these different memories, different timelines that were shown after he died, were simply just fictitious constructs? Because the enemy said like eh, it's kind of real, kind of not really. Eh, I don't know, but but Akitana couldn't confirm the principles under which Return by Death functioned. For all she knew. Subaru could very well have been shifting to parallel worlds after every death. Maybe. Perhaps even overwriting an existence of himself that was from a world where he was still alive. There simply wasn't any way to confirm or deny that branching planes of realities actually existed. Not yet anyways, right? We don't know. I mean, maybe Satala knows. Maybe we can ask that next episode. So, to say that these worlds where Subaru had died didn't still exist, well, that wouldn't be correct. So, Subaru wasn't able to annul himself of his crimes just yet. He wasn't even able to confirm that they actually existed. Instead, he was stuck forever considering the possibility of what could be. Echidna could see all the pain that these lingering thoughts of doubt brought with it. So, her recommendation was to simply break with the past. Leave all the crimes he's committed behind him and focus only on moving forward. Is it crimes, though? I don't know. I feel like he's way too harsh on himself and to call it a crime for fucking just dying. Well, I guess it's kind of messed up that he killed himself in that beginning of season two and made Wilhelm and Felis beat us like Felis very, very mad. But I don't think these are crimes. They were words that Subaru thought were intended to console him. But consolation was neither what Subaru needed nor wanted. He wants punishment. He wants to atone for his sins. He wasn't so shallow as to allow Echidna's words to make light of every sin he's ever committed. But even so, Echidna still continued to try to sway him, using her words to counter everything that Subaru would say. Yeah, what the fuck was this scene, bro? She was just spinning, mouth not moving. We were on a complete yap session, like, and we're just fucking translating an entire web novel, like, book, just holy. Subaru believed that no one could grant him forgiveness. But the Echidna that knows his past says that she can. Subaru felt that no one could judge his crimes for him. But the Echidna that bore witness to each and every single one of them says that she will. Okay. Subaru believed that no one could approve of him. But if Echidna couldn't approve of the Subaru that was right in front of her, then instead she would reject the Subaru that won't forgive himself. I mean, all of these things that she's saying is just to sway him to his, her favor, right? 
I wonder how much of this she actually believes, or if this is all just a fucking act that she's doing, countering every part that Subaru says in order to forge a contract. Himself. She was relentlessly bombarding Subaru with words that tried to get him to resist. She wanted Subaru to cast aside his regrets so that he could keep pushing forward. The reason for which only became clear after Rikidina offered to make the pact. Now- It's a pact now, not a contract. For Minerva to interrupt a ceremony as sacred as the creation of a witch's pact, well, that was certainly no minor issue. Alright. Whatever scheme it was that Echidna was planning, it had gone to trigger Minerva's rage. Minerva has always been out there looking out for us. Even like she was the first one to show up and be mad that, you know, t fucked us up, right? Minerva, I think, I probably shouldn't trust her, right? This is another thing of like, oh, how convenient. We got saved by one witch, but hey, 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 there, there are witches at the end. You never know what they're all about, man. So with two witches now simultaneously appearing in front of Subaru, Akidana had no choice but to explain the true nature behind their coexistence. Yeah, everything we heard was fucking cap. They can all just exist here. As we learned in the anime, Substitution wasn't actually necessary, but there was a specific reason as to why she only let one witch out at a time. Why? If Akidana's soul was to be left alone with the soul of any of the other witches, then that would put her own self in danger. Alone? There was always the risk that another witch would try to defeat her in an attempt to take control over her domain. Ah, oh. but she still has complete authority over this domain of the Dream Castle. But someone could challenge her and beat her in like a 1v1, and then just own the rights to this place? Okay. Using Sekhmet as an example, she alone was powerful enough to defeat not only Echidna, but also the four other witches combined. Damn, the power scaling of this girl! I mean, of all the girl designs too, I, I, like Sekhmet's design is it's nice. Like, I'm not really a lolly, I'm, I, don't, I don't like these lollies, I'm not gonna lie guys. Like, <laughs> Gluttony, Tifon, Daphne, they don't do it for me. Carmilla, get out of here. Minerva, now we're talking. Segment, oh, we're really talking. But segment power scaling. Really? She can beat every one of them. So to allow her to be present at the same time as Echidna was a risk to her very existence. Or so she says. Echidna was speaking all these words as if giving Subaru the exact answer that he needed to hear. And Subaru was much too quick to accept these words without even giving them a second thought. So, Minerva had no choice but to strike Subaru in the back of his head, giving him an impact that felt powerful enough to rip it straight off. Thank Instead, you? Instead though, it revitalized his entire body and mind, allowing Subaru to fully comprehend what it was that she was trying to get him to see. Specifically, the parts about how Akidina's pact wasn't all that good for him. Wonder what happens when Minerva does the opposite of hitting? Because like, her entire power is just like, you, you fuck shit up and it gets healed up. Can we then assume the opposite too? What, what can she do like... What if she tries to heal? Like, she's not punching. She tries to like cast healing magic. I don't know. And then that's like... Then doing damage. I'm just trying to think of like... If she punches, if, if the cause of destruction is the healing, is there like an opposite? Right off. Instead though, it revitalized his entire... Just remember, directly answering any of my questions, like, you're just spoiling. Just remember. Just, just, just be a little bit smarter than getting baited with that question, okay? Body and mind, allowing Subaru. Surely, ReZero watchers are smarter than the average audience, right? Surely, you can understand that giving me a yes or no answer to topics that was not mentioned yet is considered a spoiler, right? To fully comprehend what it was that she realized his entire body and mind, allowing Subaru to fully comprehend what it was that she was trying to get him to see. Specifically, the parts about how Echidna's pact wasn't all that good for him. You see, Minerva knew quite a bit about how Echidna tends to treat her pacts. As the witch who's interfered the most in history and made the most contact with humans, Echidna had numerous- Interfered the most, most contact with humans, okay. ...numerous examples in which her pacts didn't end in happiness. So, Minerva wanted to prevent Subaru from falling into that same situation. Now, there wasn't anything wrong with Echidna wanting to tag along with Subaru on his path to the future. Her initial explanation of the compensation actually had Subaru ready to dismiss Minerva's warning. I mean, it sounds way too good to be true. She's straight up saying, like, we'll just solve all your problems at first glance. But she's only telling us the positive. It's like, what's the negative? Like, what, what do you get out of it? But Carmilla's words went to add to that extra layer of doubt. The thing is, she wasn't interfering because she wanted... 
I wonder how many more times monkeys are gonna type if greed story, if greed story. Like, I get it. I understand. This You're like the 70th person telling me this is the point at which we go to if greed. Okay, I get it. Help out Subaru. Carmilla just wanted to get back at a kid enough for having deceived her. She was the type of witch that found it absolutely unforgivable when people betray her trust. In fact, her words were spoken with so much disdain that if Subaru hadn't been looking at Carmilla's face, then he wouldn't have known that it was her that was talking. Go back, go back, go back. But Carmilla's words went to add to that extra layer of doubt. The thing is, she wasn't interfering because she wanted to help out Subaru. Mm. Carmilla just wanted to get back at Echidna for having deceived her. Okay, okay. She okay. was the type of witch that found it absolutely unforgivable when people betray her trust. Hmm. I mean, is that really due to lust? No, I'm just trying to think of like how- I don't even know how to fuck like lust even applies to her. Everyone else, it kind of makes sense, but... She doesn't seem lustful, but simply people just like seeing her will change her into a person that they lust for, I guess. Like, I, I guess that makes sense, but this, this girl just seems like the most sweet, innocent girl that just, <laughs> just gets bullied around. In fact, her words were spoken with so much disdain that if Subaru hadn't been looking at Carmilla's face, then he wouldn't have known that it was her that was talking. It was also clear from the look in her eyes that she now bore a significant hatred towards Echidna. Oh, I didn't see any of that in the anime. She was just this crying little girl the entire time. A hatred that even Echidna began to regret as having become the outcome of her little play. Really? In any case, Subaru wasn't just sitting there listening to these two bicker. He inserted himself back into the conversation to demand that Carmilla explain exactly what it was that Echidna was hiding. If she didn't, then how would he ever be able to understand? Before that could happen, Echidna tried to assure him that doubting her now would do him no good. But that's when yet another witch entered the picture to become the mediator. Giga Chad. Unlike the other witches, Sekamet wasn't there to give Subaru a warning. She was simply there to ensure that no one resorted to force to get their way. If they did, then Sekamet said that she'd step in and kill them. Huh. No one is allowed to force their way in. He's like the holder of justice right now, literally being a mediator. Why though? That was the purpose of her existence. That being said, Tibin that's the purpose of her existence, to be a mediator, to make sure that no one is forced into something? That's what a slothful witch does? Okay. To tame the prospect of fairness, she did give Subaru the clue that allowed him to understand the consequence of making a pact with Echidna. Maybe I am too focused on... Like, the sins and how every action of these witches should be revolving around the sins, but, you know, these personality types can be independent from those sins, so I guess... Sekhmet is a very just person in terms of making sure people are treated fair and no one's forced into anything. As the author himself summed it up, if Subaru had gone ahead and made the pact with Echidna, then she would have used his power to witness every route imaginable. Yeah, so it's gonna be like literally every possible route. Like, she says optimal route, but I don't think we're here to speedrun. Like, Echidna, I don't think, is really here to do an any percent speed run to ensure Subaru's success. It's like, I just want to go through every different path. Every single different branch. Literally some visual novel shit. We're going to go through every single route. And then we're going to get way more content out of it. Which means that Subaru's just going to be suffering over and over and over. We're just taking the long route. We're going to see everything, bro. She would make him go through every possibility first before finally pointing him to the optimal future that he desired. <laughs> That's messed up. <laughs> Just for the sake of her content. She wants to see everyone die, everyone suffer, like she wants every single route and then we get the route that Subaru wants. It was essentially the same thing as saying that she'd make Subaru die over 10,000 times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, like, again, like, it sounds way good to be true. If it is, it's a fucking scam. She conveniently leaves out little details, like tells half-truths. All for the purpose of gaining knowledge on any and everything that she possibly could. That was the essence of the lengthy speech that Echidna had given him. Honestly though, for us? Wouldn't you guys want to see that? Like, I'm kind of down. I'm like, totally down with Echidna. Just like, going through different routes and showing us more Rezero than ever before. That would be very fun for us, but now. Would that be fun for the main character? Not really. That being said, there's actually quite a bit more to it than what we were shown in the anime. I mean, it's quite literally a massive wall of text. 
Jesus. No paragraphs, no new lines, just continuous sentences. <laughs> it really is worth the read, though. So I'll see if I can leave it in the comments or... I, I look at this and I don't even want to look at it. It's just so unreadable. As an image in the description so that you Ugh. can read yourself. It'll make complete sense out of Akedina's true intentions. In any case, her words were all that it took for everything that existed between herself and Subaru to crumble into pieces. It was far too cruel a revelation to know that everything had been meticulously set up just so that it could lead to this moment right here. Yep. But the final nail in the coffin was the stuff about Beatrice. That's right. Echidna did this shit for fun. Just to see what kind of answer Biaco would come with. While poor Biaco has been waiting 400 years. Waiting for that one person without knowing that she should be the one taking action. One thing that the anime didn't mention was that Beatrice's initial purpose wasn't to watch the archives. I thought the purpose is to hand over the archives to the person. Kidna had created her with completely different intentions in mind. Hmm? One that perhaps relates closer to Sanctuary than we may think. What? But yeah. Wait, you can't just drop that and not explain? Right here. But the final nail in the coffin was the stuff about Beatrice. Yeah? One thing that the anime didn't mention was that Beatrice's initial purpose wasn't to watch the archives. Akidina had created her with completely different intentions in mind. Oh shit. <laughs> I guess we're not gonna know until the next couple of cut content. My, my, my interpretation of this is... Biko is not only waiting for that one person, but also Biko is supposed to choose that person. That's what Akidna wants, right? Akidna wants to see what kind of person will Biko choose, but Biko doesn't know that. And on top of that, that chosen person will then be handed over all the forbidden... I'm not sure if it's forbidden, but the knowledge from the hidden library, right? That's what's going on. One that perhaps relates closer to Sanctuary than we may think. All right. But yeah, that's pretty much everything you need to know about episode 37. And then Satala showed so up. I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit more about the story. Bro, that drip, the golden flowers, and... I think you guys are cooking. That, like, Natsuki Subaru's tracksuit. The gold, black, white. Like, uh, I, I see it. I see the color scheme. And if you did, then be sure to leave a like or comment. Also Will do. Please go check out Mr. Annie News' channel. Here's the link. Check it out. Here's the link. Boom, 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 boom. Come on. Chat, yeah, come on. Send it, send it, send it, send it. There it is. And that's pretty much it from this cut content. What was the really interesting things that we learned? I wanted to see more Ro like Wilhelm scenes, right? I wanted to see more Wilhelm get emotional scenes. That would have been nice. That was talked about. That was missing here. There was the Puck and Reinhardt stuff. The dragon sword, bro. Just giving life back is fucking mind-boggling. And the statement that if I do not do this, that girl cannot be saved, which could imply that Subaru regressing is something Puck knows. And that's something that I've been really hounding on in the beginning of season one. Specifically because Break Time even mentions how Puck would and Puck and Subaru kind of know each other despite never having met, right? So I, I, I do definitely agree with this. It's just like there's never been an exact statement from the anime that would suggest so. And then some sad stuff with Carmilla just being bullied and being used by Echidna. And that's pretty much it, right? That's pretty much it. I'm not sure exactly what Ennius is hinting at with the Biko stuff or maybe I'm misunderstanding and what I've said about how Biko is the one that's supposed to choose the chosen person rather than waiting for that person. I think that might be what he's hinting, but that's it for me. I'll see you next time.